Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, special uh, meeting for the TIF presentation uh, regarding the developments and all the information regarding that. Uh, I'm going to just an FYI, I'm using my phone tonight to look at my, because I've got this and I don't want to have this, so I'll be looking at that. Good evening, Council. Everyone. Good evening. Um, let's see. Roll call, please. Mayor Lowry. Here. Vice Mayor Grimm. I'm here. Councilman Bond. Here. Councilman Cook. Here. Councilwoman Eggleston. Here. Councilman Lindsay. Here. Councilman Rogel. Here. Seven members present. All right. And let me get back to the All right, and tonight's um, invocation. invocation, thank you, will be done by Pastor Heater. I apologize. It's been a long day. Thank you for having me. Heavenly Father, we just graciously pause and give you thanks, Lord. I ask that you bless the city council members for the family, the families, time, the hard work, the dedication of the city. God bless your city, Lord, and bless your council. Just ask us in your powerful and precious name. pray. I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, action of the minutes, non-communications. Uh, we'll have a tip presentation by Mr. Gregory Daniels of Squire, Peyton, and Boggs and Wall for Mr. Griff. I guess I'll hand it over to you if you want to. Thank you. Thank you, members of council, members of the public. We have a presenter tonight. His name is Mr. Greg Daniels. He is an attorney out of Columbus, Ohio. He is an expert in his field. Uh, so we have him down here to give a basic overview of Ohio tax and current financing or TIFs. This is a very common mechanism that uh, cities use to assist with the development process, um, whether it be industrial or residential. Um, so um, without further ado, we will have Mr. Daniels. Right here. He does have a slideshow, so we'll be uh, focusing on the TV as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Randy, members of council. Great to be here. Again, my name is Greg Daniels with Squire Patton Boggs. Um, I have uh, been working in the economic development field and TIF field for a little over 20 years now. Uh, have a lot of experience with TIFs. Very happy to be here tonight to go over the basics of TIFs. I do have a slideshow to help guide our discussion, but I do like it to be a discussion. So if you have questions, things you want to talk about along the way, just stop me. Uh, happy to uh, stop. If, again, this is a very high level overview. There's tons of nuance as you get into different areas of TIF law. So if I can work the tech here the right way. All right. What is a TIF? So uh, a TIF is a key economic development tool uh, in a lot of states, including Ohio. I would say, especially in Ohio, it is the key economic development tool that cities, villages, townships, counties use to help out build out the infrastructure that you need for job creation, for housing, uh, and other critical infrastructure projects for our communities. So you see these all over Ohio. There are hundreds upon hundreds of active TIFs currently. Um, I've been to every corner of the state talking about TIFs and working on TIF fields. They are an extremely common way that communities, uh, a tool they use to meet their infrastructure challenges. So what exactly does a TIF do? Um, think of it as tax redirection. Uh, whenever you build a new house or a new office building or a new industrial uh, factory, that increase in value goes onto the tax duplicate. It creates new taxes. What those, and new real property taxes is what we're talking about here. What you can do with those new real property taxes by enacting a TIF is redirect them to pay for infrastructure improvements. So rather than going out to all the various other taxing subdivisions that would normally get the new taxes, for a period of time they go into a TIF fund that is used to pay for that infrastructure that in general is necessary for the make the project happen. I, I say in general. Um, 
there is what I like to call a but-for test uh, associated with TIFs. It is not a strict legal test. You do not have to say the project will not happen without the TIF. But as a policy matter, as I'm out talking to different communities about TIFs, um, I always find it best to ask that question just from a policy standpoint. Would this project, would this infrastructure happen but for the TIF? And if the answer is no, we couldn't do the project, we couldn't do the infrastructure, then that starts to create the policy reason to actually implement the TIF and get the infrastructure built and the project built. So again, that's not a legal test, but as I'm talking with a lot of different <coughs> communities, that sort of conversation <coughs> always comes up. And so I always like to talk about it initially when we're talking about TIFs. So some fundamentals. Um, in general, the maximum term of a TIF is 30 years. So that's the window of time. And it can be a moving window, but it's a window of time that you can capture the incremental taxes generated by new development. It can be up to 100% of those taxes. What you can't do is capture existing taxes, so you're capped at 100% of the incremental taxes. So all the existing taxes that were in place when you initially enacted the TIF, those are unaffected. They continue to go to the various taxing subdivisions. It's just that new increment. I have a, another slide here in a minute that we'll get to. There, are in some circumstances um, a recent amendment to state law that for very large TIFs allows you to extend them up to another 30 years. That's happened a few places a few times. It's not very common. Most TIFs live within that 30-year lifespan. And generally, you'll see TIFs range anywhere from 10 years to 30 years, depending on how much money you need, what you're trying to finance in terms of infrastructure. So as we talked about a little bit, um, the TIF captures just the incremental taxes. They go into a fund. So if you establish a TIF, uh, your finance department will actually establish a separate fund that the money will go into. The county still collects it like real property taxes, but then they'll send it as a what's called a TIF remittance to you, and it'll be deposited into the special fund that can only be used for the designated fund purposes. It doesn't go to general purposes. It goes to what you set up the TIF to do. Um, occasionally, um, you set up a TIF in a way where you might owe some compensation to the school districts. That probably happens in about 30% of the TIFs that I work on. And say the majority of the TIFs, about 70% of them, you set them up in a way where the school district gets all of its incremental taxes. They're not captured by the TIF. The county sends the school district directly its taxes. So the school district is essentially held harmless in that case. So most of the time when we're doing TIFs, you're talking about the 30% or so of the taxes that do not go to the school district. That gets captured by the TIF fund. You use it to pay for infrastructure. So this is just a... Uh, couple charts that I put together. Um, so on the left hand side, uh, the incremental taxes in both of these charts um, are represented by the, uh, I'm not sure what color that is, uh, but the reddish color there. Um, the base property taxes are generally a small sliver of it. You can see that's continuing to go to uh, the various taxing subdivisions. Um, and the TIF captures the rest of it. So uh, the, the, actually the big red chunk in this example is your base taxes, including the school taxes, that the red chunk is the schools. On the right-hand side, that pie chart shows the TIF redirecting all of the non-school taxes to the TIF fund, that's the blue. The school district is held harmless. It's getting all of its red money. And then the purple sliver is the base value. Because usually when you have these tests and you're doing it on undeveloped parcels, um, maybe one to five percent of the value is what we call the base value. It was what was there to begin with. 
ninety five to ninety nine percent of the value is new it's actually being created by the project that you tip so that's one of the reasons why those tools are so powerful you get that value creation it creates you know, you know, 95 to 99 percent more taxes and you direct a portion of that to your TIF fund to fund infrastructure improvements. So I've been talking a little bit about school districts. That's because aside from this council, the only other entity that has a say in whether or not you do a TIF would be the school district. And that's only if you don't hold the school district harmless or only if you do uh, a longer term tip. So involvement of the local school district for any kind of tip, including tips where you're capturing, capturing incremental school district taxes, you can go up to 10 years or a 75% incremental tax capture without any kind of school district. Approval. You give them a notice, 14 days before you act, they can come, they can comment at your meetings, but they can't stop you from enacting the tip. Except for a non-school tip, more on that in a second, exemptions over 75% or over 10 years, you have to get the school district's permission or at least their acquiescence. They cannot object to the tip. If they object to it, or if they don't approve it, if you want them to approve it, you can't adopt a TIF longer than 10 years for 75% unless it's what is called a non-school TIF. And a non-school TIF is, again, where you are telling the county to send the school districts all their taxes that they would have otherwise received after the TIF. You're holding them harmless. If you hold them harmless, you can go up to 30 years 100%. So as we're talking about TIFs, as we're structuring, TIFs usually all come back to the numbers in terms of how much money you need, matching them up to your infrastructure improvements that you need to pay for. You're basically looking at one of these three flavors of TIFs, either a 10-year 75% TIF that you don't need school district approval, but the school district is not held harmless, the theory being it's a short-term TIF that no one has to live with the TIF for very long. A TIF over 10 years or over 75% still capturing some school revenue, but you're getting the school district's permission because they agree with you on the value of the project. Or a TIF that's normally 30 years, 100%, but you're holding the school district harmless. So I, a lot of the work on TIFs is figuring out which of those three basic choices is the right one to do. And it varies by project by project, by community by community. Again, I would say 70% of the TIFs I work on are the non-school TIFs where they're held harmless. And 30% are fall into one of the first few categories where either we're keeping it short or we're negotiating with the school district. And just one final note on this particular slide. Uh, the joint vocational school district tags on to whatever your local school district agrees to. You don't have to get a separate agreement. They get the same deal that the local school district does. They're, they're typically a very small percent of the taxes, so that's, that's the theory there. They, they get the same deal because they're a school district, but usually they're less than 5% of the school taxes overall. So, as I said, TIFs are the key economic development tool in the state. And uh, what that has done is created a lot of different TIFs out there. Uh, there's at least eight different TIF statutes right now. Um, these are, I've provided a rundown of the major ones. There's some minor ones that I run across maybe once every five years that are not up here. But for our purposes, as we're talking about TIFs in this community, um, we are likely to do one of the first three if you go ahead with TIFs. Um, sometimes we do what are called downtown redevelopment districts. Um, those are really specialized more for um, you know, incentivizing technical campuses. 
you know, some communities want to have tech hubs or some communities want to plow tip money into historic buildings and renovations. Uh, that could be an option someday down the road. But I think for this community here, uh, we're like, likely to either have a what's called a commercial or a parcel tip. That's for commercial improvements. Those are your office, your industrial, your retail type improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, and that money, again, goes to fund public infrastructure improvements generally in support of those private improvements. Um, sometimes uh, we will do what's called a 41 tip or a special municipal tip. That is for property that either is or uh, has been or will be in the city's chain of title. That's really used in an urban redevelopment context. Even small communities sometimes will use this tip. For example, if you have some areas in your downtown that you want to see redeveloped, sometimes cities will buy those. That makes them eligible for a 41 tip. And you can use that money for what's called any urban redevelopment purpose, even the private improvements. So especially as you're trying to redevelop older parcels and older buildings, that might be a tool you can use. Um, this third category, called incentive district tips, I am seeing uh, a lot more activity around these lately. They were very popular in the early 2000s. Then the housing crisis hit, but they're making a comeback today. And uh, again, these are uh, almost exclusively used for residential areas. They're the main statute under which we can tip single family residential. So especially with what's been going on in the housing market lately, a lot of the increases in costs these developers are seeing, not only the private improvements, you know, actually building the houses, but even the infrastructure, the roads, the water, the sewer, the sidewalks within the developments. Um, I've been seeing a lot more communities use residential incentive district tips to help out with that infrastructure to make a project balance out where new houses can be built in a community. So again, these are the, the four most common types I see used in communities like this community. Um, I think probably mostly what we'll do here, if the if you determine to go forward with the TIF, would be an incentive district TIF or a commercial TIF. Those are most likely. Brandon. Can you expand on the certain levies are excluded and what year those levies had to have been uh, on the ballot for those to be excluded? Uh, yeah. Um, so incentive district TIFs, um, because they can TIF a much wider area within a city than your normal tips. Um, so again, generally your commercial tips, those are just commercial properties. That's 15 to 20 percent at most of the community. Most communities are primarily residential areas. Uh, residential incentive districts are thus can be used over more uh, of your city. Uh, because of that, there's sensitivity around uh, capturing all the countywide and in some cases, township or library levies for TIF purposes. So there's some level of protection built in for some of those levies. Newer levies, generally new money levies voted in after 2006, are excluded by TIF. Uh, what that means is um, basically if, some, if one of these agencies is going to the ballot and getting, you know, not a renewal, um, you know, not a continuation, but real new millage that increases the amount of money they have for them, those are excluded from the TIF. It's not captured by the TIF fund. It continues to get paid as normal taxes to those agencies. Um, let's see. Those the types of TIFs. For your public infrastructure improvements, you know, we talked a lot, most of the TIF money will go for public infrastructure improvements. Um, the statute's pretty broad. Uh, it seemingly gets broader a little bit every two years as you have budget bills or transportation bills in the General Assembly and someone wants to add on. Um, most of the time, you're using TIF money for what I'll call traditional infrastructure. And I'd say in 90 to 95% of the cases, Cities are using TIF money for roads, for water, for sewer. That's the predominant use. Uh, the statute was amended a few years ago that uh, if you use TIF money to fund those improvements, 
You can also use the TIF money for major maintenance, um, not like filling potholes or street sweeping or things like that, but when you're doing your major 10 or 15 year resurfacing, uh, you can now use TIF money to resurface your roads or do major maintenance on your water and sewer needs. Um, other less common, but you still see these a fair bit, uh, off-street parking facilities, whether those are parking lots or parking garages, especially in your bigger cities, that's a very common use of TIF. Uh, environmental remediation in brownfield areas, uh, that tends to be a pretty popular use of TIF money. That can be used on both public and private property. Um, site acquisition uh, in aid of industry, commerce, distribution, or research. Occasionally, you'll see communities that want to buy a piece of property uh, for an industrial park. You can use TIF money for that. Um, demolition, similar to environmental remediation, you can pay for demolition on um, brownfield, private, privately developed brownfield property. Um, stormwater projects, and then uh, utilities, including for economic development purposes, private utilities. So your privately held electric and gas can be eligible if you have an economic development project. So that's it from a high level overview. I know I just <laughs> threw a lot at you. Happy to answer any questions, uh, go back, expound on certain slides. Council? So, you buy a house, you probably your taxes are, say, four grand. Uh, that one grand goes to the city. If, with the TIF, that doesn't go to our general fund, that goes to a TIF fund. Right. So, using very broad numbers in your example, uh, a, new, a new house, if the total tax bill is $4,000, you probably have, let's say, $100 of base value, $100 of taxes on the base value. That goes as normal. All right, all the various tax and subdivisions, including the city. Then you have a big chunk of school taxes. If we do a non-school tip, the school district is getting, let's say, the next uh, $2,000, just to pick a number, because we're holding them harmless. The other $1,900 of that tax bill, uh, except if we're doing an incentive district tip for the protective levies, but let's say we don't have any in this example, that $1,900 is going into the TIF fund to fund the public infrastructure improvements until those are built and paid for. At that point in time, once everything's paid for, most cities uh, dissolve the TIFs and everything goes back in. Doesn't the developer provide the infrastructure? They do in a lot of cases. Um, no, the last one we heard, they said yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. In terms of developments for things like single family home developments, um, it varies development by development, but what we've been seeing lately is the infrastructure costs more than they can afford to pay for the infrastructure given the increase in costs that everyone's experiencing. And what that means, unless they can figure out some way to close the gap with outside money, they just won't do the project. They'll move on. Yeah, hold on. Is it good, Mr. 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 Long? I just have a quick, so this is basically a loan to get the work done, is that correct? In an example we're talking about where you have a private developer who's willing to upfront build the infrastructure, yes, it's basically a loan. What the city would be saying is, you know, you build the infrastructure, you prove your cost to us. Uh, you know, you go and they have to privately finance that because, you know, a few communities will sell bonds to do that, but most of them won't. Um, and then all the city is saying is, as this TIF money materializes, as you build houses, they get valued and start paying the taxes. As that money's coming into our TIF fund, we'll write you a check. Just pay as we go to repay them. 
So what happens if they don't sell as quick as yeah. you still have a monthly payment that we're there half the no. day, or is it just no. as it comes mm -hmm. in, they yeah, get it? it. If in. it doesn't it's come in, they don't. Pay as, yeah, pay as we go. I mean, it's. And is the money, where is the money coming from? Is it federal money? Is it state money? It's, it's all the local real property taxes. A portion of those, uh, you know, the home gets built, valued, now paying taxes, a portion of that gets redirected into the till. Oh, so okay. as those okay. homeowners are paying. So it's in the rears and just. It's, it's in arrears. There's always a period before any money starts to materialize. And, you know, it, these developers, they're, they're pretty sophisticated. They understand that. They build that into models. They know how many homes they have to build <clears> and what pace to get paid back when they want to get paid back. But they also understand if it doesn't materialize, they're left holding the bag. It's their job to get the homes built. <clears throat> Thank you. That's good. So, when we did the Quinn Creek years ago, the city took out infrastructure bonds, which is why we got put in the way we're in now. We structure it the way that it puts it back on the developer to develop their parcels, they're going to get their money back quicker. But it's just the increased property tax that goes into the fund. So, and it doesn't really recoup all what they paid for. Very, and stay, please correct me if I'm with my statement, but. It does not repay the developer 100 percent they still it typically does not yeah it, usually as you're negotiating the specifics of any any one of these tip deals and they're all a little bit different there'll be a portion that the developer is expected to pay for and get no reimbursement and then you're you're looking for that gap you know and asking them for evidence and trying to figure out what's your real gap in your financing what do you have to close to make the project viable for you and it's that gap that you want to repay them for. You don't want to go beyond it. I would just like to stress to the council, this is property tax. Income tax is our primary funding mechanism. Property tax counts for maybe 8 or 9% of our overall, and don't quote me on that exact percentage. Very small proportion of our overall. Okay. 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 So if I understand you correctly, sir, the TIFs on both of the diagrams for the non-school and it says pilot improvement, the schools still get their tax money? For a non-school tip, that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. they're, out, they're out no tax money. So you remember, and maybe I can go back, uh, slide or two here. Um, your three basic flavors of tips. You have your short-term one where you don't need the school district, but they're not made whole. Okay. You have your middle one in this uh, slide, which um, is longer than 10 years. You need to get the school district on board. And then you have your final one, what are called non-school tips. So that is the TIF terminology, non-school. They're held harmless. You can do 30 years, 100% TIF. Because the school district are held harmless, you don't need their permission. Again, I'd say 70% of the tips in the state fall in that non-school tip category. Okay. Well, I was just wondering if the school was going to be out any money if they were still getting on the new developments, if they would still get their tax dollars off of the yeah. new development. If you do a non-school tip, they would get all their money. Okay. Thank you. Um, real quick, before we get too much further into this, it's one minute to our next meeting. So, do you want to just carry this on, or how, how do you? That's on, that's on you. You guys want to just continue on? I have it built yes. in. Right. I, didn't, I mean, I didn't want to cut it short. I didn't know if we wanted to end this legally and then just pick it right back up in the next meeting or just go and start the next meeting like whatever you guys want to do. It's on your agenda <laughs> for overflow. Um, so, I think to hit your legal ad specifications, you might want to adjourn this one and go into your regular session. Okay. Second, we'll pick it right back up. I second. Uh, <clears throat> Councilman Robel. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Vice Mayor Grimm. Yes. Councilman Bond. Yes. Councilman Cook. Yes. Councilman Eggleston. Yes. <coughs> Councilman Lindsay. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Accepted. Seven zero.